Come on. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, it's time for uh, our comrade Aaron Bastani to uh, get up on the stage. Uh, Aaron Bastani is the co-founder and senior editor at Novara Media and has a doctorate from the University of London. His research interests include new media social movement and political economy. He has written for Vice, The Guardian, The London Review of Books and The New York Times and regularly appears on the BBC and Sky News. In his new book, Fully Automized Luxury Communism, Bastani conjures a vision of extraordinary, extraordinary hope showing how we move to energy abundance, feed a world of nine billion, overcome work, transcend the limits of biology, and establish meaningful freedom for everyone, rather than a final destination such as society merely heralds the real beginning of history. And uh, well, his uh, keynote address will be followed by a short uh, interrogation by Aaron Etzler, who is the General Secretary of uh, Vanster Partiet. He is also a uh, author and a journalist, and uh, after that, uh, the audience will be free to uh, ask some questions. Uh, yeah, questions. All right, welcome up, Aaron. Twenty-five minutes. Forty-five, Forty-five minutes. Kelly Mamlu, merci, comrade. Right. So, my trip didn't get off to the best of starts because my bags, my luggage, were lost in transit. But I, I don't want you to feel too guilty because it was Norwegian Airlines. Um, uh, however, I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to be talking about these ideas to a foreign audience. And I'm very happy that the book's been translated into Swedish. It's a real privilege uh, for one's book not just to be published, but to be published into multiple languages. So, what is it about? It's a very provocative title, but what does fully automated luxury economies mean? And what's the, the book trying to achieve? So in the next 30 to 45 minutes, uh, I'll try and offer a pricey of what the book is about. It's composed primarily of three parts. The first is a diagnosis of the present moment, what I call a great disorder. The second part is how the future is already here. Uh, there's often a, a statement people say, oh, well, the, the future is too complicated to understand. Actually, it turns out the present is too complicated to necessarily understand. And then the final and third part is about what kind of political program would you want to bridge this gap between what seems like a political impasse in the present and, quote, unquote, inventing the future, which is what we want to do as socialists, communists, even radical social democrats. Even radical liberals, might say. So, the first part, the great disorder, what does that mean? It borders on cliche to say at the present moment is more crisis. You could talk to a Swedish Democrat, you could talk to somebody on the centre-right, you could talk to the CEO, you could talk to you know, a very class-conscious trade union member, a working-class person. Generally speaking, a young person, old person, people accept that the present moment, the present era, the zeitgeist, is one of crisis. And I start with this proposition at the top of the book, because it's useful to, to start at a point where everybody agrees. There's generally a consensus that things aren't quite you know, proceeding as they should be. So what does that mean, the great disorder? My diagnosis in the book is that the global financial crisis, which starts in 2008, was the first wave of something far, far bigger, of a set of challenges over the course of the 21st century, which I think are very likely to imperil market capitalism and its continuation. So let's quickly start with the global financial crisis, the sort of breakdown of neoliberalism over the last 10 years, that leading edge of what I call the great disorder. In the United States, home ownership is now at its lowest level since the mid-1960s. In Britain, home ownership is at its lowest level since the mid-1980s. Now, this matters because the fundamental pillar of consent for 20th century conservatism was property ownership. And when that can no longer be reproduced, conservative orthodoxy, as we see with Trump, and increasingly as we see with people like Salvini or Johnson, has problems. That's not the only cause of it, but it's one of many, but it's a, also a big one for the future as well. Then you've got productivity. Productivity is measured 
outputs or GDP per person per hour worked. Very easy thing to measure. In Britain, productivity hasn't gone up for 12 years. This has not happened since the invention of the light bulb, or in other words, the advent of industrial capitalism. <coughs> then let's look at wages. Britain, again, wages haven't really gone up in the last 12 years. They've stagnated on a per person basis, and that's actually worst of all for the young. United States, food stamps, federal assistance for food, it's probably the best indicator of absolute poverty in the country. You, you literally can't access food which you need to live through wages. Pretty good measure of things not functioning properly. Now, before 2007, around 26 million Americans were on food stamps. It's a lot of people, but as we'll see, it, it gets a lot worse. After the crisis, it goes up to about 46, 47 million. So the number of Americans on food stamps almost doubles after the crisis. And Donald Trump said something very interesting in 2016. He said, you're all, you're all telling me in the media that Barack Obama has done a fantastic job for the economy. Then how come 40 million Americans are still on food stamps? And for all the talk of fake news, that 40 million figure was entirely correct. So even after eight years of a democratic president, even after eight years of massive state intervention with Tesla, with bailing out the banks, with quantitative easing, liquidity to give to businesses, to, you know, to hire people, to invest, etc. Still, after all of that, after almost a decade by 2016, after eight years of practically 0% interest rates, you still have 14 million more people on food stamps than you did before the Gulf financial crisis. So it's quite clear, despite all the unprecedented steps taken by policymakers in the last 10 years, that this system is politically and economically bankrupt. If it can't deliver rising living standards, if it can't deliver rising home ownership and affluence, at least for 50% plus one of the population, it won't command consent. Now, when I said that to people three or four years ago, you'd be mocked. But now they're beginning to see what kinds of politicians succeed in that in that context, and actually people started to get rather worried, including a large part of the establishment in Britain, for instance. But as I said, it's just one edge of a crisis. What other crises come after it? We're all familiar with climate change. Climate change is undoubtedly the biggest crisis of all. It's an existential crisis that imperils our planet, our species. Now, the most conservative estimate, really, <coughs> say that we're going to have 1.5 degrees warming this century. And actually, the science generally is saying it's going to be 2 degrees plus. The question is how far, how fast. Now, what's an issue with the politics of climate change, I believe that's what we're talking about at this conference, generally speaking, is that our planet is 5 billion years old. So the margin of error when it comes to weather systems, hydrological systems, meteorological systems, can be quite big, you know? So it may not be three, four degrees this century, it might be the next century or the century after. But within the next several hundred years, it's highly possible that our planet won't really be able to uh, sustain animals such as ourselves, large mammals. So how, how bad could it get? And this could happen this century, but it may happen the next century. How bad could it get? The big worry is that you have um, a set of feedbacks which kick in once we go beyond two degrees, which, which is often called runaway climate change. So if we go to three degrees, what happens? Well, the Amazon becomes a desert, and of course the Amazon is a huge carbon sink. It actually, right now, is producing 20% of the oxygen on our planet. If the Amazon disappears and becomes a desert, that could be enough, or it will be enough, to push us to four degrees. <coughs> At four degrees, uh, Siberian permafrost, which is already melting, completely disappears. And as the permafrost disappears, methane goes into the atmosphere. And methane is actually four times more egregious than carbon dioxide, CO2. It's a greenhouse gas and the impacts it has in terms of global warming. That pushes us another, another degree warmer. At which point, our oceans become so warm, they don't just acidify, but they themselves start to uh, release, uh, discharge um, methane hydrate, which is currently locked into the ocean. At which point you're looking at warming of five or six degrees. Now, what does a world of six degrees warming look like? Most of the planet's either underwater or desert. The parts of it which aren't are the North and South Pole. I don't know if you look at a map, there's not much of the South Pole actually that will still exist 
if we have the kinds of rising sea levels that one would anticipate, a bit of West Antarctica, a bit of Patagonia, Tasmania, that's it. Uh, and the only parts of the planet sustainable of large-scale agriculture will be the North and the South Pole. Now this would be a world of, as we understand it, 10 billion people, desert, rising sea levels, and not much land. Not a particularly nice place to live, but worst of all, is there'd be so much methane in the atmosphere at six degrees that pretty much anything with lungs will struggle to breathe. So not a nice thought. But what's remarkable, and what makes me think perhaps we do live in a, a virtual simulation of a supercomputer, is that over the next 35 years we get to determine whether that happens or not. Which is really strange. The planet is billions of years old and it just happens to fall upon this generation and probably the next one to avert that crisis, which we can. We can absolutely keep global warming at two degrees. It would take something equivalent to World War II in terms of state intervention and mobilizing, uh, al mobilizing and allocating resources, but it's absolutely plausible. Now, of course, two degrees warming is still bad, but as I hope I've illustrated quite clearly, it's a lot better than six degrees. So that's the second part of the Great Disorder. And by the way, as that begins to unfold, it's not just that the world is awful at six degrees warming, at two degrees warming, the UN predicts we have 200 million climate refugees. Uh, it predicts that at three degrees warming, the glaciers which provide clean drinking water to South Asia and China disappear. Uh, and of course, as we know, particularly in Sweden, you have issues around, for instance, the Swedish Democrats. This is obviously going to feed into, in the global north, even in countries which don't necessarily suffer the worst consequences, uh, of increasing um, political tensions. 200 million climate refugees is a lot of people. Where are they going to go? And people on the left, like ourselves, have to ensure that that doesn't feed into a reactionary nativist politics. And it's very important to emphasize this. A green agenda is not necessarily a left-wing agenda. It could very easily be co-opted by the right, incredibly easy. A patriotic love of land, a love of the Swedish countryside, the reification of nature, very easy. And I actually saw a t-shirt worn by an American neo-Nazi and it said, plant more trees, save the bees, kill refugees. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, it's, like, it's partly ironic, I imagine, but it's also probably something of an agenda for, for right-wing politicians, probably at the midpoint of this century. The rarefication of nature, preserving our beautiful Swedish or British landscapes, will clearly take priority for the right over saving human beings. And as I'll talk about, hopefully, a bit later on, we're kind of already seeing that. Thirdly, the third aspect of the Great Disorder is demographic ageing. Birth rates fall, people are living longer, not everybody, actually working class people in Britain and the United States and a number of European countries aren't, but we have a, a significant uh, part of the population more generally which is living longer. Now, in 1900, the leading causes of death, believe it or not, were infection, influenza, cholera, Things that were basically solved with the invention or the discovery of antibiotics. Today, the leading causes of death are age-related. We all know that. Cancer, heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's. And actually in Britain, believe it or not, maybe it's the same here in Sweden, I don't know, dementia is the leading cause of death now. Has been for the last two years. Which signifies that clearly uh, the, the politics and the politics around health will be increasingly oriented around older people. So, so what does that mean? Why is this a political problem? Well, if you have an ever-shrinking pool of, of taxpayers to pay for an ever-aging population who have increasingly capital and labour-intensive uh, health issues, that's going to create issues, it's going to create economic problems. Uh, so if we think about, for instance, the, the labour and the capital required to even cure somebody of heart disease, okay, it's, it's not too bad. Cancer, it's slightly more. Dementia, wow, hugely capital-intensive to care for somebody with dementia. Hugely capital intensive to care for somebody who's recovering from uh, cancer or stroke or heart disease at 80 or 50. And Standard & Poor Credit Ratings Agency in 2016 determined that around 25% of all countries on earth would go bankrupt or they would see their debt status reduced to junk purely on the base of demographic aging. Now, that's obviously not inevitable. I'm not saying that will happen because we're already seeing the political <coughs> response. In Britain, they want to put the pension age up to 70, for instance. That's one way of doing it. I'm sure you have similar issues here around the politics of ageing. We can't afford to have pensions for people anymore, you know, until they die, basically. 
the median age of a man in some parts of Sheffield and Glasgow is 65. And the Conservatives want to put the pension up to 70, which is a tacit admission of saying you have to work until you die if you're working class. So that's demographic age, and that will get worse and worse over time. Incredibly capital intensive. Of course, part of the solutions I'll talk about at the end is socialising social care in a manner equivalent to the NHS. And when people say, well, we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to have a healthcare system like that that's so um, generous. The complete opposite is true. In the UK, we spend around 9% of GDP on healthcare. We have universal coverage. In the US, they spend around double that. I think it's about 17, 18% now, but it's going up every year in the US. And as we know, the US has shorter life expectancy than Cuba. As a woman, you're more likely to die in childbirth than in Bosnia. That's not me criticizing Bosnia, but it's a country that until relatively recently was, you know, in a state of civil war, and was formerly the poorest part of the former Yugoslavia. So clearly the American healthcare system isn't working. And so the response to people that say, well, we can't afford an NHS-style healthcare system for the elderly, is actually, no, we can't afford not to have that kind of system. So, economic crisis, climate change, Demographic age. The final part, automation and technological change. Now this has multiple aspects to it, domestic but also global. Let's talk about the global aspect very quickly, because it's often neglected in these discussions. In the 1970s, workers in Western Europe and North America became too expensive. So capital relocates to East Asia, primarily China, Taiwan, South Korea, and they start to make the things that they formerly made here. So today, for instance, in Italy, around 70,000 cars are made every year. This is a country which gave the world fiat. It was an, you know, an automotive superpower until the 1970s, had some of the most militant workers on the planet in the 1970s, and of course, capital relocates. Now, the claim made by the ruling class is that, well, look, this actually worked out well for everybody. It gave the global north cheap consumer durables, cheap cars, cheap fridges, cheap computers, through credit, fine. Not necessarily work, okay, that's a bit of a problem, we'll park that. But it also meant we could raise millions of people out of poverty through uh, industrialising China. Okay, let's buy that argument. By extension, they would then say, well, Nigeria, which by the midpoint of the century will have a bigger population than the United States, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Indonesia, the world's largest Muslim country by population. By extension, they would then say, well, look, as wages get too expensive in China, which by the way they are, wages have been uh, surging for a decade, well, capital just relocates to those other places, won't it? Except it won't. Because China is the world's largest importer and, uh, uh, how can I put doesn't this? It doesn't produce them, but it basically has more industrial robots than any other country on earth. And it's really pulling away from everybody else. And so in China, because workers are getting so expensive, you automate. And you see this, of course, in the very uh, impressive quote from a, a leading Taiwanese CEO, Foxconn CEO, uh, Terry Liu, I think his name is. And he said, having to deal with a, a million workers makes me sick. And so there was this desire to automate large parts of the Foxconn supply chain. The great story in the South, South China Morning Post, about 60,000 workers in one factory uh, being put out of work. Now, that's probably Foxconn propaganda, but that's what they would like to do. So if you're Pakistan, you're Bangladesh, you're Nigeria, that means you don't develop. That means you don't have the same developmental trajectory that we saw for these other countries over the last 40 years. Now, Africa's population is going to double between now and 2050, going to probably quadruple between now and 2100. The world's largest uh, cities by population by the end of this century won't all be in South Asia, they'll increasingly be in Africa. Dar es Salaam, Lagos, um, Nairobi. And yet, as I've already made clear, they won't have the kind of developmental trajectory we've seen in, in South and East Asia over the last 40 years, which for them creates major geopolitical problems, of course. Combine that with climate change, declining crop yields, declining fresh water supplies, increasing population, increasing consumer demands, uh, more electricity, for instance, and yet less work, less foreign direct investment. And this creates what I call a global unnecessariat. They are not necessary. They are entirely superfluous. They aren't needed either for production or for consumption. And there's a great quote that talks about this issue of an unnecessary. 
probably heard it. It's a real cliche quote, but I'm going to repeat it. In the early 1950s, Henry Ford III was joined by Walter Reuter, who was a trade unionist for the United States Automotive Workers Union. And Henry Ford, this is probably at that point the most advanced industrial uh, shop floor in the world. You have the first industrial robots. And Henry Ford III is walking around, and he's pointing to the robots, and he says to Walter Reuter, Walter, how are you going to get those robots to pay your union dues? At which point Reuter turns back and says, Henry, how are you going to get them to buy your cars? <laughs> which is a hugely important question in regards to underconsumption and demand. Automation is a major part of that. In the global north, it's not quite as bad, but it's still pretty bad. Now, let's be conservative and not say that the robots are going to take all our jobs. I don't think that's going to happen, by the way. What we will see is that because of automation, machine learning, big data, what today requires 40 radiologists in a hospital will be able to be achieved by two radiologists in 25 years' time. Why? Because it's about pattern recognition, it's highly repetitive, it's very data intensive. So all of a sudden, where do those radiologists go? You know, these are highly skilled people. They've studied. Where do they go? And people say in response, well, look, we'll be creating lots of care work. And care work, because you're on the left, care work's good. It is good. Yeah, of course it is good. But the average care worker in the United States earns 20,000 US dollars a year right now. And if you have the only labor sectors being in care, which is the case, eight of the 10 fastest growing jobs in the US are in care work, if you already have a low paid sector and pretty much every other profession is losing people and they're having to enter things like care, clearly you get further wage compression. And even if we're concerned about what automation does, we have to understand that the market for uniquely human skills shrinks. And for economists who aren't actually particularly left wing, they say that will undoubtedly lead to a massive increase in inequality. Massive. Because if you do have a uniquely human skill, you'll be paid more. And if you don't, you'll be paid less. You'll see your wages fall more and more. Uh, and this is called The Spread in a book by uh, Eric Brynjolfsson. Destroyed his Icelandic name, my apologies. Uh, and, and a colleague of his in the United States. So automation poses problems. Second part of the book. I've probably spoken for about two thirds of the 45 minutes. I'm sorry, I'll be quick. Second part of the book. <coughs> says, well, look, I've already depressed you with the first third here. My apologies. Maybe you bought a flask of, of vodka or whiskey. Possibly not. I know it's very, uh, you have very stringent alcohol laws. Here. <laughs> very, it's very strange you're going to buy alcohol everywhere. Um, I've depressed you with the first third. Let's talk about the second third. Because actually this is incredibly optimistic. But also sad in a way. Because the left hasn't yet grasped much of it. And its possibilities. But it creates. The future is already here. One of the criticisms I've heard about my book is it's science fiction. You know, this is Star Trek. No, I'm talking about very specific, concrete innovations, case studies, which are already happening. Let me give you one example. Gene editing, CRISPR-Cas9. People might get worried gene editing is it's eugenics. What's going on? Don't worry. CRISPR-Cas9 was a process which was discovered. It's actually a natural process. It's how bacteria have their own immune systems to repel viruses. Crazy, I know. By the way, viruses aren't living organisms because they don't reproduce in a way that we really equate to living organisms. Again, quite crazy. Bacteria, when they're confronted with a virus, replicate the certain parts of the viral DNA. It's not really DNA. The information of the virus. They, they then mirror it within their own DNA, and they basically create immunity to the same viruses in the future. So it's almost like a, a cut, copy, and paste of, of genetic information. Now, remarkably, in the last 10 years, scientists have worked out how to do this, how to replicate it, how to cut, copy, and paste genetic information. Now, we've had gene genetic engineering for decades, but this is remarkably quick, and it's remarkably cheap. So today, you can find in the United States 15 and 16-year-old school kids changing uh, the genome of a bacteria so it glows in the dark. 30 years ago, that would have won you a Nobel Prize. Today, it's being done by school children. Quite remarkable. Now, what's the low-hanging fruit for that technology? <clears throat> Thousands of health conditions are the result of a single errant nucleotide. So just as in digital information, we have zeros and ones, with DNA, we're not just made of DNA, by the way, but it's the instructions for how we're made. 
With DNA, you have four nucleotides. Think of this like the binary of zeros and ones. The combinations of the nucleotides give us who we are. We're effectively expressions of information. People say, well, that's an ideological claim. No, it's not. Because actually, uh, in 2014, Harvard scientists managed to store digital information as DNA and then convert it back to digital information. So generally speaking, equivalence between two things means you can use an analogy between the two things. Thousands of conditions are created by single error nucleotides, cystic fibrosis, sickle cell anemia, Huntingdon's. Also, for instance, um, a liability to get Parkinson's, uh, early onset dementia, cancers, heart disease, etc. Now what CRISPR-Cas9 means is that we can edit uh, genetic data and all of a sudden, uh, low-hanging fruit here, get rid of a lot of health conditions. Now if you're thinking again, like speculative, it's science fiction. 2017, a dog breeder in Mississippi called David Ishi writes to the FDA, he's a gene hacker as well as a dog breeder, he writes to the FDA in the United States and he says, look, I breed Dalmatians, but all my Dalmatians have gout. I don't know if you know this, apparently Dalmatians have a tendency to get gap. And I want to, and I've isolated the specific nucleotides to give them gap, and I want to stop them getting gap. And of course, this person's a dog breeder. And dog breeders have been messing with the genetic information of canines for a long time. So he just sees this as an extension of being a dog breeder. He doesn't even think about it, you know? We've inbred these poor animals, and you look at a wolf, and then you look at a pug, and you think, how do we do this? <laughs> how did this become this? So he saw it as an extension of what we've been doing as humans for 12,000 years, or even earlier, actually. And FDA, don't respond, don't respond, don't respond. About three weeks later, the FDA, press statement, public statement, press release, we are going to treat edited genetic information like a pharmaceutical drug. How interesting. Why would you do that? Because, of course, there are vested interests in the pharmaceutical industry who want to make huge amounts of money from this. If you're Pfizer, or if you're GlaxoSmithKline, or if you're Bayer, all of a sudden a lot of your patents are losing a lot of value if people can just say, we've switched off cystic fibrosis, we've switched off Parkinson's, we've switched off Huntington's, just like we did with uh, <coughs> smallpox in the 1970s. We got rid of that through immunizations, vaccinations. Imagine that happening all of a sudden within a generation to dozens if not hundreds of health conditions. <coughs> there are vested interests who don't want to see that. Now that technology is already here. The question for the left is, how do we subordinate it to people, not profit? Now in Britain, we have the NHS. So it's highly likely that, that research, that dividend of human ingenuity, will redound to the public good. Not entirely, but more or less. In the United States, because of a political settlement which hasn't socialised healthcare, they won't. Which is to say the technology in isolation isn't going to sort these problems. You also have to configure an appropriate <coughs> politics i.e. socialised healthcare. If you don't, it doesn't matter if you have CRISPR-Cas9. And we already see this, by the way, with pharmaceutical drugs. Pharmaceutical drugs are at the front line of some of the tendencies <coughs> I talk about in the book, because pharmaceutical drugs have their value because of information. Not labour, not land, actually in many cases not even capital. They're expressions of information. And we know how capitalist interests have treated pharmaceuticals. Faced with abundance, they have to constrain them. They have to make them scarce. They have to make them rare. And that will increasingly be the golden rule for capitalism over the coming century. So an economic system which has given us a great deal of abundance in many ways, of course at a huge human and ecological cost, but it has, will increasingly be defined by imposed scarcity, monopoly, and rentierism. It's not just CRISPR-Cas9. <coughs> we saw it with digital technologies at the start of the 20th century. Um, we'll see it time and again across the economy. I'll talk about some other aspects, not just CRISPR-Cas9. Let's talk about cellular agriculture. Again, we're talking about green issues. How the hell can we feed a planet of 10 billion people when we're 7.5 billion and already we're living over the planet's biocapacity? Right now, we're consuming all the resources of 1.6 planet Earths. We're going to have 2.5 billion more people with rising demand. How the hell can I write a book called Fully Automated Luxury Communism? That's ridiculous. My response would be, lobster, champagne, and Kobe steak for all. <laughs> and that's not just a provocation. Again, cellular agriculture, 2011. A very intelligent man, a Dutch professor called Mark Post, 
has isolated, actually it's in 2008. 2008, by the way, we looked at it as a really remarkable year. The first 3G iPhone goes on sale. Since then, they've sort of billion handsets. We have the onset of the global financial crisis, and somebody works out how to make meat without animals. You know, in 100 years' time, they go, wow, that was an amazing year. But because we're living in history, we don't really think of it like that. 2011, that process, which was isolated by Mark Post, becomes a thing. We have the world's first beef burger, hamburger, without animals. It costs $325,000 to make. Today, that same burger is $50. So the cost of cellular agriculture is falling in a way that's almost equivalent to the full cost of computational power. Now, to be clear, there's two kinds of cellular agriculture. There's one where you edit the genetic information of vegetables to make them more closely resemble animal proteins, like with the Impossible Burger, using some of the technologies quite close to CRISPR-Cas9 I've just talked about, with gene editing. A different way of doing things is quite literally creating meat without animals uh, from the cellular level up. Now, there are papers out there, whether it's by the US government, whether it's by investment companies, and when looking at cellular agriculture, production of beef, for instance, they estimate that if we transitioned all meat production from animals to this, you'd be looking at 90% less CO2 emissions, 90% less land, 90% less water. And by the way, we grow more crops to feed to animals to, to then feed ourselves than we grow for ourselves. More fresh water is used for animals we eat than we drink ourselves. So we have to move away from animal agriculture. Obviously. But we also have to accelerate it. And at the same time, we need to ensure that the global south participates in that. And we can't leave that to the market. So again, it doesn't matter if you can have a Kobe steak and it's the equivalent of $1.50 and it's ultra healthy. And by the way, it's been edited in such a way that it's going to basically minimise any risk of heart disease. It doesn't matter if three quarters of the global population can't access that. It's irrelevant. And there's technology after technology which I say create the basis for a new kind of society beyond scarcity, beyond work, beyond the division between cognitive and manual labour. Now Marx, as I talk about at the end, Marx says that one of the essential features of communism, and there's a few, is there is no distinction between manual and cognitive labour, there is no distinction between work and play. That's Capital Volume 3. And it's also in some of the earlier Marx, the kind of polemic about being a critic in the evening and being a hunter in the afternoon, etc. So those are the technologies, and they're here. I'm trying to think if there's any more. I'll end with a, a film to quite neatly express this, I think. Who here has seen, hands up, maybe I've been talking too long, you've kind of fallen asleep, you probably don't understand quite a lot of stupid words I'm saying, my stupid accent. Hands up, who here has seen Elysium with Matt Damon? Okay, that's good. Who, who hasn't seen it? Be honest. You have to go see this. It's one of the most important political provocations of the last decade. Now, at face value, it looks like kind of, you know, boilerplate science fiction. Matt Damon, okay, Matt Damon saves the world. God, again. Right? It is that, but it also has a very important political message. Matt Damon is living in California in the, what seems to be the early 22nd century. Because we've had catastrophic climate change, we've had rampant inequality, Basically, the world's elite have left planet Earth and they all live on this commune, this community beyond our planet. It's the ultimate gated community. It's the ultimate capitalist fantasy. Not even having to see working class people. And this place is called Elysium. And everything is revolving around them. It's like, it's utopia, it's paradise. All the uh, jobs are done by robots. They have things called med bays, so people basically stay permanently young. There's no disease. I'm not saying this is going to happen, by the way. This is a political parable. The people on Earth are having a really horrible time. Working class people are having a really, really shit time. And Matt Damon is a, a worker. And he gets radiation poisoning. Because he's exposed to a nuclear material. And he goes to his foreman. Foreman in English, I'm sure you know the word foreman. He's superior. He says, I've been poisoned. What do I do? He gives him three tablets says, you're going to die in four days. Take these. And it's, uh, I think it's iodine sort of basically stable for radiation poisoning. And Matt Damon works out that he has to go to Elysium to save himself. And he has a friend and she has a daughter called Freya, which I believe is maybe a Scandinavian name. Freya. And she has leukemia, this little girl. 
And she says, well, she has to come with you. She has to access a med bay too, so you can both live. Yeah. And they go to Elysium with some criminals. One, you know, suspiciously resembles Che Guevara. <laughs> it's, very, it's one of my suspicions and my conspiracy theories. They go to Elysium. They're put on a med bay. Can't fix you. Sorry, you're not a citizen of Elysium. Med bay doesn't work. And these med bays can do anything. It doesn't work. So what do they have to do on Elysium? They work out they need to change the operating system of Elysium and reconfigure who citizens of Elysium actually are. They need to change the operating system of that society. It doesn't matter about what technology, uh, technological innovations you have. It doesn't matter if you have the capacity to create unbelievable abundance. If it's only in the service of a small <coughs> subset of society, for the rest of us, it might as well not exist. So the final C, I'm going to ruin this, I'm afraid. <laughs> But it's important, the final scene is Matt Damon dies. He dies changing the operating system for Elysium. And immediately it says, Citizen of Elysium, humanity. The med bays work on the little girl. Immediately the robots and their prime directive is to look after Citizens of Elysium. They go, my god, we've got billions of people down there that need health care. They're unhoused. You know, They're living through violence and poverty. We need to go help them. So that transformation of the operating system I view as, effectively, a victory in the class struggle. This is strange. <laughs> the technology doesn't mean everything is the point. Politics also matters. And I view that as analogous to the present political situation. Uh, and if you look at the story of Salman, uh, Alan Kurdi. Who here has heard of Alan Kurdi? Probably slightly less than Alicia. Alan Kurdi was a three-year-old boy born in Syrian Kurdistan around 2011. Again. What a remarkable period of time we're living in. He was born in 2011. I think he dies in, in 2014-15. He was a three-year-old boy from Syrian Kurdistan, born in war. And his image was effectively across every newspaper in the world uh, when he was washed up on a beach in Bodrum. Three-year-old Syrian child fleeing Syria, <coughs> seeking refuge in sanctuary in Europe. Three-year-old boy. Now, three months earlier, SpaceX launched a rocket which was the first ever autonomously piloted rocket it can be used again and again and again. Which is to say the rocket goes up and it can come down. Which basically makes private space industry viable. Okay. We will be going to Mars in the next 10 years, 15 years. We're going to have a space-based 5G internet because of this innovation. It's a big innovation. It's like the stirrup on a horse of feudalism. It's like the transistor for uh, the digital revolution. It's a big, big innovation. It's a bit of a game changer. So we already inhabit a planet where we have autonomously piloted first stage booster rockets and, that's, and yet a three year old child is dying in Bodrum trying to access basic healthcare. We don't need Elysium to actually see those problems. They're already here. What Elysium helps us to understand is that planet is only going to get worse and worse and worse. The benefits of human ingenuity, it's not capitalism that's created this technology, it's human ingenuity. By the way, I started out by saying, that, how much time have I got left by the way? I don't know. I'm going to pre talk for the whole conference if I could. How, how long? Five minutes? Ten minutes? Three minutes? That's good. I'm almost done actually. Yeah, that's good. good. Uh, I said that antibiotics were so important and infection was the leading cause of death. A very intelligent person created, um, created penicillin and he gave it away for free. So when people say, oh, you're using an iPhone, how can you be against capitalism? I say, well, you use antibiotics. And that was given away for free. Does that make you a communist? <laughs> HTML, again, Tim Berners-Lee, 2012, London Olympics, this is for everyone. He gave the world HTML, which basically is a huge part of how we use the internet today, for free. So again, every time you use the internet, that guy gave something really critical away for free. Are you a communist? No. I wish you were. <laughs> I, wish, I wish it was that simple. So I suppose I'll leave the third part of the conversation about how do we bridge this incredible raft of possibilities to create a future that's worth having? How do we invent the future as the left? Thank you very much.
so uh, let's proceed to the uh, interrogative phase of this, uh, Aaron versus Aaron. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot. Now, there's many people in this audience, but I think maybe we can uh, split ourselves into two kinds of people. The ones who knows all about automation, artificial intelligence, geonetical uh, hacking, and the rest of us who doesn't know much of this at all. I just want to make you feel sure that I am of the second type here. This is the only book I, I read about these things and uh, my knowledge about this is as shallow as my American accent which probably will shift to British the more we talk. So um, I thought we'd focus on the political aspects. Your message is not that technology solves humanity's problems but also that it requires a revolution that we have to leave capitalism and establish a new kind of society. So, um, now we've seen at least three decades when the working class has been, you know, trying to defend its gains and while capital has been on the offensive. But you seem to think that these changes in technology um, really uh, may change the tide so that uh, that 99% of us would have the advantage towards the 1%. What is really your case for that? Yeah, so two things. Firstly, we need to understand that most of the 20th century was a, a political counter-revolution. Well, not most of it, actually about 40 years of it, but it was a counter-revolution. World of 1900, if you're a woman, you couldn't vote in most part. I think you could maybe in New Zealand, but most of the world you couldn't. Uh, you didn't have rights to abortion. Most people didn't have suffrage. The global south, obviously, uh, wasn't a great place to live, obviously, colonialism. And we see with women's rights, we see with civil rights, anti-colonialism, trade unionism, the labor movement, you have an unimaginable world by 1955, 1960s, the one 1900. Unimaginable. And that was a revolution, in a sense. Not in a, you know, in a, in some places it was, but in a sense it was a revolution in class relations, forms of consciousness. And we have a counter-revolution, which is neoliberalism. We need to understand that was a counter-revolution. So that's the first point. Uh, and I don't view it as a thing in itself. You know, I view it like Burke viewed the French Revolution. Edmund Burke and conservatism isn't for anything. They're about stopping something. Uh, that's not to say neoliberalism didn't have its own agenda. It does. But I think now, confronted with these technologies, confronted with climate change, demographic ageing, etc., it's now confronting existential challenges. And so on the one hand, it's up to us to create the future. But on the other hand, if we don't, things aren't going to stay the same. So I think that kind of... I like scepticism. I love scepticism. I don't like cynicism. Because cynicism often, or pessimism even, can often be irrational. Right? Doesn't mean, just because you're pessimist doesn't mean you're particularly rational. And I don't think it's rational to say that this will carry on, this economic system will carry on, because of the challenges I've talked about. And so that, I think, is one of the critical things here. We're looking at technologies, we're looking at the challenges. This is not fully automated luxury communism or business as usual. Things are going to get much, much worse unless we intervene politically. Yeah. Okay, so, but let's start with one of the major problems. I brought an article with a guy that you quote in your book, Carl Benedict Frey, Economic History. Yeah. And what he says is that um, maybe we should understand the voting for Trump also <coughs> as a function of automation. Mm -hmm. And he says that he has looked into three states, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Pennsylvania. They've all been won by Democratic uh, candidates mm -hmm. since 1992. And yeah. suddenly, they were won by Donald Trump. Yeah. And there's much uh, in the case that it, it, it's something about automatization and robotization. Because if you look at these election districts, you can see that this is one of the most automation intense places yep. in the US so that people who are being replaced by robots uh, are more probable to vote for a conservative candidate such mm -hmm. as Donald Trump mm -hmm. and while we now can see automation spreading around the globe and even here in Sweden and so on are we looking into the possibility that these people will feel totally left behind and start voting for someone like Donald Trump who says I will protect your job I, I will do anything and I will, I'll fix this. Yeah, I wouldn't even say it's likely. I'm, I'm going to say it's inevitable. And the 20th century left was an alliance of working class people in towns and cities and also intellectuals. And what we're seeing in the early 21st century 
is a break between the working class and major cities, increasingly ethnically uh, diverse, and towns. So in England, for instance, major towns, Barnsley, Bolsover, 100 years these places have been bastions of the left, 100 years, they're now voting for the Brexit party. And that is a function of automation and also globalisation. And globalisation has this really interesting feature, it's called a clustering effect, which is uh, even if you're a hairdresser or a taxi driver or you have a takeaway shop or you're a delivery driver, it's far better to have those jobs in London or Stockholm than in a small town. Why? Because there's a huge market, for instance, or a masseuse in London, you can command significantly more, there's a lot more work than if you're in Barnsley. And so globalisation, that combination of globalisation and automation, is going to lock out significant parts of the working class, often white, yes, <coughs> often outside of major metropolitan areas. Now that can be viewed through the prism of race, that's fine. Partially, of course, it is. But as historical materialists, we need to understand there's also something going on here. And we need to be able to tell these people a story about a different kind of future, a different kind of modernity. And if we don't, this is precisely what will happen. Trump won in the US, people say, Trump won because of white nationalism, race, yeah, all true. But he won because he won four or five specific states in the Rust Belt which should have voted Democrat. And that's not gonna change unless a Democrat candidate is like, you know, resembles the politics of Bernie Sanders, for instance, I think. And which people forget, those were people voting for Obama in the previous elections. Mm -hmm. So something must have been happening. I mean, of course people were disappointed in Obama, but there's also things happening. And what I hear people say uh, when we try to talk about automation is that it's something like in the vein of this. Well, we talked about this for 50 years, but we can't see it happening yeah. because we still are pretty close to, uh, you know, I mean, 90% of all people who are in the work age mm -hmm. still have a job. Yeah. So how can we have automation? Why, why isn't this showing up? Yeah. And well, then, yeah. Well, my answer would be go to your nearest high street. In England, you go to places like Derby, Nottingham, again, larger towns, although they're cities, but they're not major metropolitan areas. The town centre looks like it's been hit by a bomb. It looks like, oh, it's a Derby. Derby is the, you know, the heart of the Industrial Revolution. You have these amazing, gorgeous, gorgeous buildings, 200 years old, like Palazzi of the Industrial Revolution. Empty, decrepit, right? It's a really depressing place. Now, why is that? It's because the internet and out-of-town shopping has completely reconfigured retail, right? And so why has that happened? Because of just-in-time uh, distribution, because of digitization, uh, and because basically log logistics has been transformed by technologies. Now, that's just the first step. Because, as we're seeing now self-driving cars, uh, you're gonna see increasing automation with regards to logistics and distribution. And something can be very, and again, skepticism is good. But let's look at warehousing. People say, well look, all the new jobs are going to be created in warehousing. We'll have lots of warehousing, lots of logistics jobs. Go to an Amazon uh, you know, um, depot. Yes, there are workers, but most of the work is being done by machines, and increasingly the work will be done by machines. To answer your question quite precisely, I hope, there's, a, there's an idea I talk about in the book called Moravec's Paradox. And Moravec's Paradox is basically, in the 1950s, that cliche of science fiction, technological change, we thought the hardest thing a machine could do is beat a grandmaster at chess, right? That's what we thought. Oh, Gary Kasparov just lost the deep blue. It's all over. Actually, that's the simplest stuff to replicate. And our brains are composed of three parts. A little reptile brain, a mammalian brain, and a, neo a neocortex, which is basically unique to us and other primates, in a sense, right? And the intelligence, the, 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 the machine, if you want, and this is a metaphor, of the mammal brain, the reptile brain, is millions of years old. And it's very difficult for machines to replicate that. So I'll give you an example. When something's coming in your peripheral vision and you think it's a threat, you flinch unconsciously. That is not your frontal neocortex, that is not executive function. That's your mammalian, that's your reptile brain. Now, if you're driving and you don't want to hit somebody, that's really important. And so actually, it turns out that creating a robot which can pick up a paperclip, recognize what it is, and put it back with the paperclips is a lot harder than creating a robot or washing the dishes is a lot harder than creating something which can beat Gary Kasparov. So what does that mean, concretely? It means that jobs which are information intense, using big data, etc., will be the first to be automated. They are the first to be automated. Often they're white-collar jobs, legal services, accountancy, 
They could be automated. What are the last jobs to be automated? Cleaners, care workers. Uh, and so I suppose the political response then is, sectoral, we call it in England, but we call it here, sectoral wage bargaining. If these are the sectors which are going to still need jobs for a long time, and people, because they require fine hand motor coordination, which would be the last thing to be automated, I'm happy to admit that, uh, we need to have sectoral wage bargaining, otherwise the, the price for that wage labor will go down and down and down and down. So I would argue in the near to medium term, 25 to 30% of jobs will disappear. Not all the jobs. But even just that, look at Greece. Greece with 20% unemployment is not governable. Now if that becomes 20, 25%, not governable. So if that becomes the global norm with climate change, with demographic aging, even if, and that's a really quite conservative estimate for what automation does, just that as a big political challenge, so we shouldn't take it lightly. Or I think <coughs> if, if we give away chess to robots and are left with cleaning, that would also be kind of depressing, I think. <laughs> but uh, let's move on to the solution, because I think your book is very optimistic and is also very inspiring, both to look at what's happening in the world today. I actually think that this analysis is better than most classic Marxist analysis, which talks about, you know, the working class has been weakened by neoliberalism and globalization. <coughs> And I think there's always been something lacking in that because, uh, well, of many reasons. But I think that when you get into these stuff that we are actually moving toward another political system, another uh, economical system, I think it all functions. So I think those who will read the book, which is all of you in here, just <laughs> take a look at that because it actually describes our world better. But what you describe is also the solution which you call fully automated luxury communism, but to me looks a bit like the social democracy with people working a lot less. Mm. Uh, one of the things that, I mean, if the problem is that the biggest companies will reap huge profits uh, of automated work, that they will have a monopoly on that, then one of the biggest challenges is kind of to get their profits back to the general public. So there's a, there are different ways to do that. One of them is the basic income thing mm -hmm. that many people are talking about. The right wing is talking about it because they see that this problem may arise. Another is a shortage of working hours, mm -hmm. which is to say that if, if you only need actually 50% of this work, then maybe all of us should work four hours a day instead of eight hours a day. And then there's your proposal, which is the basic services package mm -hmm. that says that education, healthcare, transportation, housing, and information should be free for all. It should be guaranteed by the state. Can you tell us a bit about how that would work and why that is the best model? Yeah, so I suppose you've got universal basic income, UBI, uh, which is, a, is, a, is a, a wage which is completely detached from work. So there is a, there's, a, there's an argument, well look, this is anti-capitalist because you're detaching the wage relation from um, the worker. They're no longer being exploited because, uh, again, some, some Marxology in English, my apologies. Marx, how are we exploited? You work, the surplus value you create goes to somebody else through profit. With UBI, that kind of isn't the case anymore, necessarily, all the time, right? So th there's, there's an argument, there's definitely a left argument for UBI, I'm not gonna deny that there isn't. However, I prefer UBS because, firstly, climate change, demographic aging. Uh, UBI isn't gonna help quickly enough. If we have a universal basic service of guaranteed free green public transport, that is a far bigger assistance to decarbonizing our economies than a UBI. So firstly, UBS is much, universal basic services, is much better as a political response to the challenges of the 21st century, that's the first one. Care work is another one. I often hear people say, well, you, women do care work, so let's give them a UBI. Yeah? So women are already exploited in an unpaid way, so let's, let's pay them. And we kind of tacitly still exploit them because we're paying the men as well for not doing the care work, but they'll be paid for the care. Come on. No, I'd rather a, a professional, fully socialised care service from cradle to grave. And that's the UBS demand around care work, I think, is actually a much better feminist response to it than a UBI again. So, go on. So, so does this mean that you're kind of taxing the big companies with robots, etc., bringing it into the public sector, giving us all free goods? Is that the model? That's the last question. That's a good question. Yeah. So, uh, 
basically it's taking the fundamental necessities of life, there's five things which we put into universal basic services, housing, transport, information, healthcare, uh, God, Sorry. education. So these should be withdrawn from commodity circulation, free at the point of access, universal. Uh, and these are affordable because the dividend of what I call extreme supply, these things are actually getting cheaper than ever to do. Isn't it remarkable in the digital age, we can read any book on the face of the earth, we can watch any lecture, we can listen to any lecture with a podcast, and yet education in Britain and the United States has never been more expensive. Something strange has happened, and that's about the imposition again of scarcity. We should use that dividend, that technological dividend, to provide these free goods. And what I would say is, and this is the conclusion, I suppose, is that I'm a liberal. Oh my God. <laughs> in that, I think each person is uniquely placed to determine how they wish to live their life. Mm. Now, liberals like to talk about that with regards to LGBT rights. Like, yeah, fine, whatever. That's good. But it's meaningless unless you have access to basic resources like education, transport, healthcare. You can't be that person you want to be, and I agree, I can't tell you, the state certainly can't tell you. Only you can determine that. You can't have liberal ends without socialist means. Uh, and so the idea, oh, you can read Hegel and Goethe and you know, do multiple degrees, and look, if I'm gonna go to my bank balance and it says I'm overdrawn, it means jack shit. Uh, and so that's the, that's the answer, really. Subtracting these things as commodities means a, a viable socialism. Uh, and like I say, I think, it says that these things should be human rights and not commodities, which is a very strong socialist argument. Yeah, so actually, this is the last question. <laughs> we agreed on that. that. And then we'll give the word to it's you. It's a short uh, question. It is a but short uh, question. We need some uh, time for the audience. Though. Yeah, of course. We have a full half an hour here. So, one of, your, one of your definitions of socialism has been infinity pools for all. Another suggestion is that football games should be available at a reasonable price. You argue that football now has become so expensive that the working class can't see it live anymore. And your point is that socialism without luxury will never get broad enough support. If socialism only means like welfare and state-sponsored theater, what's in it for someone who's not poor or is a theater Precisely. freak? Precisely. Precisely. In England we have subsidized, we have free museums, we have subsidised opera, by the way, young people barely ever know about that, unless they come from affluent backgrounds already. And then nobody can go to a football match. In 1968, the year Manchester United won the European Cup. Please, could you, could you slow down? Sorry, sorry to be rush, rushing for time, my apologies. In 19... So, we already have subsidies for uh, culture, for the middle class, opera in England. We have free museums and galleries, and yet young people can't go to watch football. And I'll give you an example. In 1968, it was a great year for English football. Uh, Manchester United won the European Cup. The average age of somebody on the Stretford end at Old Trafford watching Manchester United in 1968 was 17 years old. Today, the average person watching Manchester United at the Stretford end is 40. So this is a basic locking out of young working class people from the kinds of cultures they want. Forget the ones imposed on them from the middle class. So, my, I would have, for instance, price caps on clubs. You here have a system of 50 plus one, which is fan ownership. I would have something like that in England as well. The problem is much worse there than here. In terms of the infinity pools for all, this was, a, again, a, a provocation. Who, infinity pools for all, this is ridiculous. Typical idiot, Bastane, tweeting nonsense. In 1930, in Britain, we started to build what are called Lidos, outdoor swimming pools. And if you go to Brighton, Saltdean, you go to Falmouth, Plymouth, uh, Hackney, they're everywhere. These lovely Lidos, 1930. And yet people say you can't do something similar in 2019. Why? It's an ideological claim. 1952, something called the Golden Lane Estate was built just down the road from the Barbican. Social housing for working class people, a nursery, a swimming pool, tennis courts, badminton courts for working class people. Today, the rent on a room, a room in the Golden Lane Estate is £1,000. So in 1952, we could build that for everybody, but we can't do it in 2019. So my, my argument is you have to have a populist agenda. I say, yeah, we can do all of these things. And the, the, the claim we can't is ideological. It's an ideological claim imposed on us by the ruling class, and the left shouldn't dare reproduce it in my Thanks a lot. And now for the audience. Should you... Uh, yeah. Yeah.
Well, it was very interesting listening to you, and you clearly explained that there will be more than enough goods around to share and distribute amongst all of us. But then I would also like to know, do you agree that the thinking of class struggle is outdated? Because to prevent the climate disaster, we need the middle class, the upper middle class, the rich, and these few eight super rich, they can go to march or wherever they want. <laughs> yeah, I would like to hear your It's a great question. Uh, I would say that actually class struggle has never been more important. Uh -huh. And yet I do agree with you. Because what you're saying is, I, I, I call it the, the lumpen bourgeois. There's an inability of the middle class, the bourgeoisie, to reproduce itself in the global north. You see that primarily in, West, not, maybe not as much here, in Britain, in the United States, in Japan, um, in Italy, in Germany, in France, in Spain, in Greece. Young people aren't having the kinds of lives that their parents lived. Now that's a bad thing, whatever class you come from. But in terms of the middle class, it creates big political bottlenecks. Uh, and so, on the one hand, yes, you need broad class coalitions, I agree with you, but we're seeing a proletarianization of much of the middle class as well. And automation, as I've said, means that jobs like radiologist, uh, lawyer, you know, a lot of those jobs for the next generations will disappear, which will contribute further to that proletarianization of the middle class. So, class struggle, I think, is a very useful lens uh, for those people. Yeah, but not hate. Not, not hate. Not, not always hate. Sometimes hate. <laughs> no, no, you're right. As a Marxist, you're a, you, it's an analytical way of understanding the ruling class. And in a sense, they are captured by that system as much yes. as we are. Yes, Because if you're, a, if you're a capitalist, and of course the golden rule of capitalism is competition, if you don't do what your rival does, put down wages, innovate, automate, you go out of business. Yeah, they're also trapped. And the worst thing of all is, you then become a worker, right? And nobody wants to be a worker. <laughs> so, in that sense, we shouldn't just hate them. Of course not. Well, we shouldn't hate them. Just hate them. We shouldn't hate them. That, there are, however, I would, I would also say, however, there are some bad people. There are some very bad people. Uh, right now, there was data that was put out this week, which said that we could probably uh, push back runaway climate change by 20 years if we spend globally... 300 billion dollars. It may, may, may sound like quite a lot, but then you realize Amazon is worth a trillion dollars. Then you realize Jeff Bezos is worth 140 billion dollars. Basically, we can buy our planet an extra 20 years with the wealth of three people. And so it is difficult to not dislike them. You know? <laughs> Jeff Bezos is currently spending tens of millions. This is remarkable. Google this. Jeff Bezos clock. He's building a clock in a mountain nobody will ever see <laughs> and it's about a long time it's a clock that's going to keep time for a million years and, I, and for that i hate him <laughs> however however, <laughs> however i don't envy him at all he's a very frustrated man yeah well, well, that's right but you're, you're absolutely right uh, class struggle as hatred uh, when we need to build coalitions especially amongst a growing lumpen bourgeoisie uh, I think is important for sure. Raise your hands if you want to ask a question. <coughs> Do you think that um, monopolization due to technology and economies of scale uh, is inevitable? Monopolies. Partly. Uh, and, and the left should say, good, right? There's a great book out, I don't know if it's been translated, it hasn't been translated into Swedish, I don't think, called um, The Republic of Walmart. And it says, and by the way, if, you have, if, a, if an alien came to Earth, <laughs> right, and they looked at how we organize society, they would see networks, markets, and states. And these things all work in different ways, right? And you'd have an, an economist, and imagine they have different colours. Things which are states are green, things which are markets are purple, things which are networks are blue. And an alien looks at them and they say, that's fascinating how you order your society and so on. But this thing you call the market, it has these things called businesses, firms. And they're run in a very similar way to states. Very top down, very coordinated. You have this person at the top, a CEO, that's kind of like a president. Very bureaucratic. 
And yet you, you're saying that markets are actually close to networks than they are to states. And so firms, ironically, paradoxically, uh, are instantiations of top-down bureaucracy, instantiations of things actually which are quite, quite close to state power. The way Walmart is run, the way Amazon is run, is actually quite similar to a Stalinist command economy. Just a thought. And so, if monopolies are inevitable, which they probably are, with, for instance, AI is a really good example of that, then we need to understand the project for the left should be subordinating that to the public interest and to democracy. Uh, so I'll give you a very brief uh, point which is relevant here. We've not talked about it. Artificial intelligence. Between now and I think 2040, AI is going to add about $13 trillion to the global economy. 75% of the putting numbers out my bum, it's all cited in the book, fortunately. 75% is going to go to China and the United States. Europe's left behind when it comes to AI. And obviously, the global south is nowhere. And so, with that kind of monopolization power, it's going to obviously disrupt or enhance geopolitical power, etc. And so, we need to say in, in Europe, well, what are we going to do about it? In, in Britain right now, there's a huge debate around Huawei, you know, how do you say it here? The Chinese uh, technology company. They're going to build our 5G network. And the Tories are in uproar. And they say, well, this is, this is a security problem, even though Boris Johnson's going to sign it off for it because somebody's giving him some money somewhere. <laughs> I can libel him here because I'm not in Britain. <laughs> right? And Tories say, this is terrible. Yeah, it's terrible. Let's nationalise BAE systems, put it away from weapons manufacture, and they can build it instead. Right? And so the thing is, with the, the technologies in the book, the technologies defined in the 21st century, require such huge resources, are so capital intensive, either it's going to be monopolistic capitalist companies, like Amazon, a trillion dollars, Apple, a trillion dollars, Facebook, half a trillion dollars, Google, a trillion dollars, or it's going to be states. <laughs> and I'd far rather have democratic accountable nation states do it, or alliances of nation states, like the EU for instance, do it, than firm. So monopoly in a way is inevitable, uh, but it shouldn't necessarily be subject, subject and subordinate to market, market rationality. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I think you're very optimistic, and I think I'll have to buy the book to get to the conclusion, because that was something I was looking forward to, because I'm not optimistic. I'm not, um, I'm not optimistic, by the way. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> but unless we do this, the planet's going to die, but yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I just would like to comment before I get to my question on the hate thing. I think we can absolutely hate them, um, because they hate us, and one um, obvious... Um, I mean, it's obvious, for example, by the moderate youth here in Sweden that came out with a proposal that is right out of the playbook of the worst conservatives <coughs> in the US. So they absolutely hate the working class and whoever is not them. Um, they want us on food stamps and, you know, yeah, the whole package. So, yeah, totally hate them. Um, but I would like to uh, put a question on what your position is on the idea of the uh, Green New Deal. That's a great question. I would say, by the way, they don't just hate the working class, which they do. They also hate the young, which is really strange. They I would say young people like to come up with this... Uh, no, no, but I, I, I'm, I'm saying, so this, this new conservatism, or this re revivified conservatism, even the young people hate young people, right? Um, and it's very, very... It's new. Because fascism in the 1920s and 30s eulogised youth and power and vigour and now this kind of strange new conservatism hates all these things. Very weird. Anyway, maybe we'll talk about that later. Um, uh, I think that low economic growth and aging populations is a very strange mix. And I'm very worried about that and what it means for the, for the, for the 21st century. Um, anyway, Green New Deal. I think it's good. Uh, in, in Britain right now there's a bit of a debate within the Labour Party about uh, Green New Deal or Green Industrial Revolution. The Labour leadership would love Green Industrial Revolution. The young people want Green New Deal because everybody, everybody wants to imitate America. That's just our <laughs> fate as Europeans, sadly. Uh, the idea is a good one. Uh, and so um, we need to decarbonise in the global north within the next 15 years. Right? So well, that's too optimistic. Well, look, we should decarbonise in the last 15 years. So, I mean, it's not optimistic, it's necessary. What we need to ensure with the Green New Deal, and I talk about it in the book quite explicitly, 
is that a Green New Deal shouldn't just be a revolution in energy, it should also be an ener uh, a revolution in social relations and how we relate to energy production and the, and, and, uh, uh, and the economic sort of values it creates. And so what, what this does, in Britain if we transition all of our energy to renewables in the next 15 years, this also represents an opportunity to make sure it's municipally owned, cooperatively owned, uh, publicly owned, and it's not owned by private enterprise. And so I think that Green Deal is great, but if it doesn't have an attendant socialist politics of ownership, of radical ownership, I think it has certain weaknesses. Furthermore, I think the Green New Deal in the US, you know, Bernie Sanders says, we're going to create four million new jobs. No, you're not, right? And you talk to people about this, his policy guy, Zach Exley, and they'll say, well, it includes care work. <laughs> I mean, fine, fine. That, okay, then in that case, we're going to create four million jobs, but I don't see how care work is, is a green job. And so again, if the Green New Deal is attached to this idea of jobs, I like jobs, right? We're going to have jobs for a long time. We've got to rewild much of the planet. We've got to decarbonise. We've got to you know, fix all the stuff that neoliberalism has broken. We've got to transform you know, run-down areas, the global south, etc. There's lots of work for the next 30 to 40 years. My worry is if the Green New Deal doesn't have a sceptical attitude to the, to the wage relation, you know, that will blunt its radicalism. And finally, the Green New Deal has to be a global Green New Deal. In the book, I argue that the global north should effectively pay for the decarbonisation of the global south. Uh, and this does a couple of things. By rolling out these technologies that quickly, it means that they experience something called the experience curve. Things get cheaper. Every time you manufacture something, you double the manufacture of a, of a of good, the price falls by between 15 and 20%. So if we say, well, look, we're going to decarbonise the whole of South Asia really quickly, that actually redounds to the benefit of all of us because it makes these things much, much cheaper. Now, again, you can read the book. This is not sort of capitalist ideology or you believe the experience curve. There's good science behind it. Um, so we need a Green New Deal, but it has to have a very uh, politically intelligent position to the Global South and also to the wage relation, I think. Hello. I have a question uh, more related to other works done within this area because your book is not the only one with a hypothesis in this matter. And you've been right now referring to the New Green Deal, which for instance Mariana Mazzucato has been a great deal about. And also you're referring to a Walmart uh, Republican, yeah. which the author or co-author of Lee Phillips also has his own hypothesis in this area. And uh, do you think that your is in line with the hypothesis and solutions of these authors that you're also referring to in other matters? So the Republic of Walmart, absolutely. Yeah, I but the uh, other book only felt from Pardon? Uh, the other work. Yeah, Mariana, I was going to, yeah. I, I disagree with Mariana Matsukato on some things. So for instance, uh, she is right to say that research innovation um, has been back, backed by the state, basically, for all the most important things for 70 years. She's right about that. So for instance, um, steam engine. You know, uh, this was created by two guys, Watt and Bolton, and they had a little, you know, we'd call it a mom and pop saw, or we wouldn't, the Yanks would. Sorry, again, another Americanism. A family business, a couple of people, and you have the steam engine. Now, what we see since the 1940s is that every single major innovation requires such a socialising of risk and research and innovation, whether it's jets, whether it's satellites, whether it's iPhone, and Mariana Mazzucato talks about this, right, the iPhone. Everything on your, on your iPhone, on your smartphone, all of the research in that was paid for by the US taxpayer. In some instances, the European taxpayer. Whether it's touchscreens, lithium batteries, all of it was funded by the taxpayer. All of it. And I would argue not a single major innovation has been done through private investment. Uh, that's not what she says, actually. She's um, but uh, what I was referring to was also the creation of value, which you are assuming to be um, sufficient and for free. I don't quite... So what, sorry, what's the, what's the question? Of value. You, in your book, you're referring to what's value created for information, so to be free and distributable. So, you mean, what do you mean value as? You mean in a Marxist sense? <laughs> you mean use value, exchange value? I think we can. Yeah, that's not how a dialogue It's not the right format. Uh, Hi, I was wondering, what are your thoughts on the role of taxation? So, for example, we know that corporate tax avoidance is a huge problem. 
Uh, we know that, yeah, technically it's legal, but tax avoidance by multinational enterprises operating across multiple jurisdictions is a huge issue. We're talking about uh, breaking the spirit of the law. So what do you think the role of taxation is? Uh, we know there is a need for some kind of, I don't know, international cooperation, global reform in terms of taxation. Yeah. Uh, taxation systems um, and how we tax um, multinational <coughs> enterprises. So, yeah, I was wondering what you think about that. It's difficult to say because you often hear arguments say, well, if we just got rid of global tax avoidance, we could pay for everything. And I, I suspect that's not true. But also, I, I don't really know. Uh, another one is financial transactions tax, the Tobin tax. Some people say, well, if we just have a transactions tax, nobody will actually notice and it could raise tens of billions of pounds in the UK. And again, we, we haven't trialled that. And I think that, again, that expresses the fact that we've lived in a counter-revolution. Nobody knows if you tax financial transactions what it'll, whether it'll work, how much it will raise, right? Uh, and again, that's because we've been ruled by people who are completely averse to overcoming the major challenges of our time. In terms of global tax, I suspect it could be of major use if we got rid of global tax avoidance and evasion. Could it, does it then necessarily mean we don't need to talk about all this other radical stuff? I don't think so. I think, I think it's a big thing. You know, in the UK, I'm sure we lose tens, tens of billions of pounds through tax evasion and avoidance. Uh, there's a great movement in 2010-11 UK and Cut really highlighted the issue of tax avoidance. Um, but as a Marxist, you know, I, I, if you're seeing stagnant productivity for 12 years, we've talked about that, if literally the average worker is producing the same amount of work output they were as they, as they were 12 years ago, that speaks to a far more profound crisis of capitalism, I think, in, in Britain. Um, and it, I think it relates to an issue of a crisis between the capitalist mode of production and technological change, you know, uh, because cap technological change now, in the book I argue, is undermining some core features of the capitalist mode of production, for instance, the creation of free things. Uh, and it's talked about by Larry Summers and Bradford DeLong in 2000. They talk about the economics of Napster. It's a really remarkable admission, actually. Uh, and they say, well, Napster is giving away all these free things for free, Capitalism can't work unless somebody somewhere is making money from something. That's literally the incentive to produce things. And so if somebody is doing the same thing for free, or they're distributing the same thing for free, that, that creates problems. And then Bradford, uh, Bradford DeLong and, and Larry Summers, they quite remarkably admit, they say, we don't know what the long-term solution is, but in the short term, it's rents and monopoly, which is quite strange. And so tax avoidance is big, but I think the crisis we're facing, whether it's technology, whether it's climate change, I think, I think there's a bigger picture to look at here. We need to sort of take a step back and say, that's one part of the solution, sure, but you know, it's not, it's not going to solve everything. Hi, Is it working? Yeah. Uh, I saw you at BBC uh, when you had this t-shirt on, I'm a communist, and you were obviously criticized yeah. by it. Uh, but I wonder, if from the reference of your book, uh, how we communists should be today. Uh, I was wondering that, I mean, obviously we need to do more. Um, we should supposedly be uh, the forerunners of the revolution or the struggles of classrooms. But what can we do besides uh, being a vegetarian? <laughs> being a vegetarian is really important, right? I'll quickly answer that before we answer the communist bit. You know, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the first to say, look, personal lifestyle changes don't matter. Politics matters. But actually, vegetarianism isn't just a lifestyle change. Because you're fundamentally more, let's be real, veganism, right? Because milk is still bad and so right. Because you're still, you're transforming your social relations to nature. You're transforming your relationship to animals. And so it's not just a, a consumer choice. It's actually, I think, a, a deeper choice than that. If you're being a bit woo-woo, it's a spiritual choice, maybe you know, transform social relations to nature. So vegetarianism or veganism, I think, is, is valuable, actually. But uh, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree, anyway. Um, but it's not the entirety of the solution. Uh, why would I say I'm a, I'm a communist? You might say, I like the analysis, or I agree with some of the analysis, I agree with some of the things you're saying, this isn't communism. And you'd be absolutely right. It's not communism. So why, firstly, what is communism? Yeah. And why is the book called Fully Automated Luxury Communism? So communism and Marx, capital three, he says that communism is um, uh, an escape from what he calls the realm of necessity, which I take to mean scarcity. He calls it the realm of necessity into the realm of freedom. Uh, and he says that 
communism and socialism are two separate things. Right? Socialism is where you change the relationship to the means of production. Right? So we're workers, we're doing our job. You would have the same job under capitalism and socialism, right? But the surplus value that's created doesn't go to profit, it goes to workers, whether it's through public ownership and the state or whatever you want to call it, right? That's socialism for Marx. He says communism is not just, clearly it does include uh, new relations to the means of production, but he also calls it a new mode of production. And a new mode of production is something much bigger. It's new mental conceptions, relations to nature, uh, production processes, forms of daily life. It's, an ex it's a revolution in a far more expansive yeah. sense. So the Paris Commune, for instance, uh, prefigured um, a new mode of production in a way because all of a sudden you had nurseries, you had men and women, you know, doing the same stuff. You had people who were painters who were communards. And the definition of an artist, like Courbet, the de definition of an artist wasn't somebody whose social function is an artist, as under capitalism, but it was somebody who, among other things, paints. So that's a revolution in the forms of daily life and social you know, relations and mental conceptions without the technology, right? So communism is a, is a much bigger thing to socialism. It's a, a new mode of production. And so in the book I say, we've had two big, I haven't talked about this so far, but we have two big disruptions in the history of humanity. The first is the Neolithic Revolution 12,000 years ago, which creates modern human life as we know it. For about 200,000 years prior to that, people exactly like us were walking around doing stuff. 12,000 years ago, we domesticate animals, we learn how to breed in and out certain features of crops of animals, agricultural revolution. We don't know how we're doing that until the 19th century, but we, we practically we grasp that idea of inheritance. We have the agricultural revolution. On the agricultural revolution, you get modern civilization, cities, literacy, numeracy, complex social formations, slavery, the nation, the nation, not quite the nation state, all the way through uh, the, uh, the axial religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, etc. Pretty, and actually, the book says, actually, for about 12,000 years, things don't really change that much until the early 18th century. And some people say, well, that's ridiculous. Obviously, things change, you know? But consider this. This is a really long answer. I'm apologizing, but it's an important sense. Machiavelli wrote a book called The Discourses. It's a great book, you should read it. And it was The Discourses on Livy. Livy was a first century historian in Rome. Machiavelli was writing this book in 16th century Florence. The fastest means of transport in Machiavelli's time was the exact same as in Livy's. It was sailing on the sea with wind. The best source of light in Machiavelli's time was the same as Livy's. It was a flame. Ditto, heating. By the way, Livy in Rome, first century Rome, had a million people. Florence had 50,000. First century Rome had clean drinking water. Right? So actually, things don't change that much. Yeah, you get water mills, windmills, printing, press, etc. But actually, it's not that big a change. Uh, and to express how fundamental the, go back, go back to the agricultural revolution, until the agricultural revolution 12,000 years ago, we don't get more than five human beings on Earth, which is about the population of Ireland today. That's the global human population. And because of this first disruption, the agricultural revolution, by 1800, we get a billion. So it's a shift, right? But it's gradual. What happens in the early 1800s, late 1700s, Industrial Revolution? Fossil fuels combine with a new technology, the steam engine. That combines with prefigured forms of earlier forms of capitalism, uh, landless labourers, forms of you know, the wage relation, print, you know, the arrival of the printing press, etc., distribution of information. This all converges around the early 1800s to form modern industrial capitalism. And what happens? The global human population goes from 1 billion, it, it took it took from, you know, uh, from eternity to 1800 it took to get to a billion. All of a sudden, in just decades, two billion, three billion, four billion, five billion, six billion. Something clearly changes with regards to human society at a global level. You get the global time-space compression, David Harvey calls it. Phileas Fogg wrote Around the World in 80 Days. 30 years earlier, the same trip takes you a year. So there's a real revolution in consciousness, technology, social relations in the early 1800s because of the advent of industrial capitalism. And I say that we're, on the, we're in the early decades of something new, of a new mode of production, possibly. Uh, and I say that actually the, the horizon for that is a world beyond scarcity, it's a world beyond the wage relation, and it's a world <coughs> beyond any division between mental and physical work. Now, 
Marx himself said, I'm not here to write recipes to cook trips to the future. Right? Now, you might think that's a cop-out. I think he's probably one of the most intelligent human beings that ever lived. So if he said it, he's probably right. What the book says is here's a bridge to get from this impasse of neoliberalism through, yes, a radical form of social democracy. There's no doubt about it. Radical form of social democracy with a critique of market capitalism, which is absolutely Marxist. Yes. Growth will not solve these problems. The wage relation will not solve these problems. Right? Market capitalism will, will grow, will grow the market will have GDP growth and the dividend of that through tax will pay for this. That's not the solution. Right? So we need to move beyond that. But at the same time, we do need a radical form of social democracy to bridge that gap in the meantime. What my colleague at Navarro calls class struggle social democracy. A very catchy thing. So that's why I'm a communist, because I think that the horizon for me is not markets. The horizon is not the wage relation um, and the social relations we live in now. However, clearly we are subjects formed in a certain period. How, what would I know beyond the things I've talked about? What does communism look like? I have no idea. I'm not going to offer the geopolitics of communism or the state system, etc. I do know it's a world where, like I said, end of distinction between cognitive and physical work, end of the wage relation, uh, and an end to scarcity. That's why I say communism. Excellent, Aaron. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I've been told that you will be signing books outside of uh, Santa. Oh, I haven't even seen them yet. That's great. Uh, after uh, this session ends, which is exactly now. So thank you. Oh, right.